Today, what I want to do is I want to tell you things this morning in groups of three, and so get ready for that. So what I want you to do is get out your pencils, get out your pens, your uh, tablets, your smartphones, your notebooks, chalk, maybe some lipstick if you have to, anything that makes a mark to get ready to take some notes this morning, because I'm going to group today's sermon into three parts. Number one, it's going to be my testimony. I want to tell you my testimony this morning. Number two, I'm going to talk about the stumbling block of Jesus. And you go, what in the world is that? Well, we're going to talk about that. And number three, I want to talk about living like the resurrection happened. The series that we're in right now is called Easter in September, which is why we have this big sign that says Jesus behind us, because that's all we're talking about this month. That's what we talk about every month, every week, but this in particular about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it means for us. Now, before I tell my testimony, I know that some of you have heard it before, but I want to tell it again because what I want to do is shine some light this morning on what Paul has to say about our stories and our life and doing life with the Lord in Corinthians 15. So if you want to flip over to Corinthians chapter 15, you can uh, get caught up ahead here. Uh, We'll catch up with you in just a minute. But also, it's important that we tell our stories. Um, our testimony is very important. So what I want to do this morning is tell mine and hopefully help you in telling your story. Think about your story as you're hearing mine and start figuring out a way to craft your story in order to tell it to other people. Get good at telling your story. And the best way to get good at telling your story is to practice and and, and have experience doing it. So the more you tell it, the more the better you'll get at it. When me and my kids go on vacation sometime, we like to go camping. And there's been times on our camping trip that we'll sit on around the fire at night and I'll say, so here's what we're going to do. We're all going to go around and tell our stories to each other. Even though we know each other's stories, we lived it. But I want my kids to get good and Teresa and me at telling our story. To celebrate so we don't also forget what God's done. To celebrate him and we can get very good at telling our all about God's faithfulness in our life. How many people could say, raise your hand, God's been faithful in my life? Then you need to be telling that story. All those hands that goes up, I mean, imagine the stories that we have of God's faithfulness. And when we read the New Testament even, when we're reading the New Testament, we're reading the stories of all of these men and women who came into contact with Christ and they're talking about his faithfulness to them. And the Bible is full of personal stories and testimonies, and that's the foundation of our faith. That is the foundation of our faith, that God's story is personal to us, that he meets each one of us individually. So that when we tell our story, each of us, we're actually telling God's story. So then the question is, how much of God, uh, how much a part of your story is God? How much part of it is he? Well, let me begin this way. Most people would start their stories maybe off this way, some of us. I grew up in a Christian home, and what that means is that my family worshiped Jesus, and they took me to church, and we had great value in God's love for me and our family and for others. You've heard me say this before, but my dad survived uh, by God's grace being a Vietnam helicopter pilot for a year over there, and what he saw was death hourly, not just daily, every single day, uh, every hour it seems like when you hear him talk uh, about his story. Um, But he decided while he was there that there had to be more to life than just this. There had to be more to life than this, living like this and dying like this. And so he has taught me my whole life what it means to follow after God and life can be better, it can be different and it has a purpose and he continues teaching me that today. Well, when I was seven years old, uh, how many people have been seven? Just, okay, just see if you're still with me, all right. <laughs> when I was seven years old in my grandmother's bedroom, I got down on my knees all by myself. I remember the carpet, I remember the sunshine, I remember the smell of the room. I remember putting my head on the uh, top of her um, bed there where she had a quilt that she had made. And I got on my knees and I committed my life to Jesus Christ, I remember. And I asked him to forgive me of my sins I believed that he was the savior to the world and I wanted to surrender my life to him. I remember in that moment a chill coming over my body. I remember um, it felt like something had entered my soul and I began to cry and I didn't understand why, but it was tears of joy. Um, I felt uh, that um, I had a feeling of purpose and a feeling of power that had come over me. 
I felt it, but not necessarily heard God's calling, his immediate calling on my life, and I felt like what he was saying to me, again, I didn't hear an audible voice, but I felt in my spirit, I'm going to take you on an adventure. I'm going to take you on an adventure, and I'm going to go with you, and you're never going back to the old life again. And at seven years old, I was like, I'm ready. Let's go, right? Seven years old. I was baptized on Easter Sunday with my best friend, Brian Carpenter. And uh, I remember going to the first grade and telling my first grade teacher, I actually went to a Christian school up till about the third grade, Cramerton Christian Academy, if you know where that school is over in Cramerton. And I remember telling my first grade teacher and all my friends what God had done for me. I was so excited. I wanted to tell everybody, but I was shocked and I was a little bit saddened that they didn't seem that interested in uh, the power of Christ and what he could do with a life that was fully devoted to him. And I gotta tell you, I'm still saddened to this day by that fact. When I talk to people today who have lost their passion or they don't see the power of God in the life of a fully devoted follower. Well, I fell in love with music uh, as a kid, but I didn't realize that God had given me a gift for it until much later in my life. So when I was about 17 years old, I met this guy named Gabe Swing. And you all met Gabe last week when he came here to church. My uh, missionary friend down in the Bahamas. And I met another guy, um, his name was Devin Kearns, and the youth pastor at the time was Tom Parnell. Uh, Devin and Gabe were in college at the time. Now, as I tell this story, what I want you to also pay attention to is all of the people that God put in my life. Because God has just put extraordinary people in my life. Don't take your mentors and disciples that God has put in your life for granted. And he's done that for all of us. And if you say, no, he has, you're not paying attention. There are people that God's put in your life. Grab a hold of those. And if you don't have them, go find them. Go get them. Show up. Make the effort to attend. Be there to be discipled. And so I did. Tom and Devin and Gabe told me that God was going to use me and, that, um, my, and my music, and they were going to be there with me to help. They didn't say, you're going to do great stuff and let us know how it turns out. They said, we're going to be here with you. Trust me. We're going to go with you. And I was at the church, 17 years old, every time the doors opened, uh, and sometimes when it wasn't opened. Uh, literally, because we figured out how to break in through the window of the church when they wouldn't give us a key. So we would climb through the window and go around and lock the door so we could rehearse and practice uh, our music and get ready. Well, I left the church that I grew up at, which was South Point Baptist Church, that I was baptized in, and I moved my membership all by myself when I was 17 years old. My parents did not come with me. It was just me as a 17-year-old moving my membership. I started leading worship over at the church, The first week I played there, uh, I played on a little keyboard that I had bought from a friend who wasn't playing his anymore for about $100 that I saved up and bought. And uh, there were about seven people there at the first Wednesday night service. Um, Just a few of my friends there at the church. Within a few months, I put a band together of all the best musicians at my high school that I thought at the time. And uh, before long, we couldn't put all the teenagers in that little house we were meeting in. And so we tore all the walls out of the house except for the middle wall that held it up. We actually had to put the band in the corner so that people sitting over here could see us. But they couldn't see those people because we just completely filled this little house. And every Wednesday night, lost teenagers were coming to Christ almost every single Wednesday. It was amazing. In fact, the cops were getting called on us a lot because the kids were parking in the neighbor's yard and they were getting upset, so the police were coming all the time. (laughs) It was kind of interesting. The band I was leading uh, continued to find some popularity uh, in that church and in some other churches around town, so much so that it turns out that we couldn't have a rehearsal without 100 people showing up. So we had to start having rehearsal in secret. And uh, all of that began to do something uh, good and bad. And the bad is that it started to make us very prideful. So one night as I was singing with the band, I I realized as I looked out at the audience that I had got off track. That I was not doing what God called me to do in that very first meeting when I was seven years old. We had this rock show going on and everybody was stage diving and all this stuff. Billy Thompson was our sound guy, so you can blame him. He was part of this show. (laughs) And everything, we were all going crazy, and you can imagine uh, teenagers just uh, doing all kinds of nonsense. One night, it got so bad that my dad, I remember standing over here, and my dad coming up on the stage and grabbing my arm and saying, you need to settle down. (laughs) 
That's how out of control we were. Uh, <laughs> but what happened this one night when I was playing is I looked out in this little church that we were in, had more people in there, teenagers, than I could imagine that church ever having with adults. And then I realized in that moment that I had made all the music and everything about me and not him. And it really bothered me because I knew that at the heart of what he called me to do was to make much of his name and I was making much of my name and it bothered me. So I realized that I had this emptiness inside and the emptiness was me trying to fill myself up with more of me and I just kept getting more and more empty. And really, fulfillment and satisfaction only comes when we fill ourselves up with him. So I quit the band, and I went back to leading worship. Well, the numbers went from hundreds of people and kids coming to less than 10, just a few people. But I was doing what God called me to do, and I loved it. So it was a big change in my life. I graduated from college with a music degree, and then I met the most sexiest woman alive. All right? (laughs) Teresa, my wife. And I fell head over heels for her, and I didn't want to tell her at first, but I was not going to be able to live without her, okay? I had to have Teresa. So with the course of one year, me and Teresa met and got married, and that was 22 years ago. And I still love you. Well, her and I were leading worship for camps and retreats all over the country, and we were doing probably about 100 dates a year or more, But I was also asked at the time to lead uh, the student band, the college band, and the singles band at Hickory Grove Baptist Church in Charlotte. So we were newlyweds that had very little money, but we were very, very busy for the kingdom. Hardly any days off. I say hardly. I don't remember having a day off. I mean, like, day off, what was that? We just, it was just constant. Um, We were trying to make the most of our youth, and I used to brag to my friends all the time that I could go about three days without sleeping. And that's about how our lives looked when we first got married and ministry. Um, I was running all over the place from one church to the next and continuing to keep running three separate bands at Hickory Grove at that same time. Now, I say we didn't have much money because I refused to charge because I wanted to see God take care of our finances and I didn't feel right doing that. So I just wanted to see what God would do. So we didn't charge any money. I... um, the churches just paid whatever you know, they wanted or whatever they, ever how much they thought I was worth, that's what I would say, which turned out to be very little. <laughs> we love you, but we don't think you're worth much. No, I'm kidding. So about this period of my life, I uh, was doing an event in Charlotte, a college event, and I met a guy, and his name was Louis Giglio. And he invited me uh, to do an event that he had started in Texas, which I'd never heard of at the time, called Passion. Um, And it turned out to be one of the biggest worship movements in the world at the time. At the same time, I got another call from a church to interview for a worship leader position for a church in Chicago, Illinois called Willow Creek Community Church, where about 18,000 people attended the weekend service. So in January of 1999, I played in Texas for Passion when they recorded the Better's One Day CD with Chris Tomlin and uh, Charlie Hall, David Crowder, David Billy Foote, and... uh, Uh, all these guys, and then the very next weekend, I auditioned at Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago. And I joked with some of my friends that I would be hit by a truck the following week (laughs) because my life had peaked. Can't go anywhere from here. So it's it's, it's got to be the the best of it, Um, which was uh, was kind of funny. But God has a, uh, he has a sense of humor. And he's always trying to teach us something. And so, just so I understand, just so I would understand that every single thing that was happening to me was because of him and not because of me, on Thursday, in between these two events, me and Teresa were asked to go play for a block party down in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And when we got there, there were fire trucks and hot dog machines, and there were people everywhere. And I was supposed to be the big thing at the end. And as I started to set up my stuff, I noticed it was getting toward the end of the day, and everybody looked like they were packing up their stuff, and they all left. And I played for three people sitting in the outfield of the baseball field. (laughs) Three, wasn't it? It was the youth pastor's two kids and one of his friends. Yeah, that was three people. And I just thought, in between, Passion and Willow is very funny. Um, I kid you not, you can ask Teresa. So 7,000 people on Saturday, three people on Thursday, and then 18,000 people the following weekend. And it was one of the most memorable seven days of my life, that's for sure. But I'm so grateful that God loves us enough to teach us lessons. 
He's always teaching us. There's always a purpose. There's always something he's trying to tell us. So I end up going on staff at Willow in Chicago, and I'm excited for all the goodness that God's going to do in my life. But um, life doesn't work like we think, does it? Doesn't always go that way. So the very week that I got there, my boss, the guy who hired me, I didn't know very much about, did something really stupid and got fired. And a week later, we've got a call that Teresa's dad had passed away, had a massive heart attack. So life for me and Teresa hit rock bottom. In our early 20s, we were alone, two Southerners living in Chicago, and they thought we were weird. We knew they were weird. (laughs) No friends, no family, the loss of a close parent, and wondering if uh, we were going to continue to have a job or a place to live. And here's what happened. Prayer became very important to us. And it's funny how life does that and God orchestrates these things so that you keep him in perspective all along. He's always trying to teach me lessons because I need it. Well, I stayed there for three and a half years and saw God do things that people only hear or read about in books, I promise you. I saw 900 people be baptized one day in the summer at Willow. It's amazing. I led worship one time for, um, for several thousand people and found out as someone came up on the stage and told me, hey, uh, everything that you say is going to be translated in over 30 different languages. It was incredible. I wrote the opening musical number for their 25th anniversary where 44,000 people attended and they raised $79 million for the building facility. It was incredible. Teresa and I made lifelong friends and life and ministry was going good. We had our first child, Hannah, and I was learning that God keeps his promises to us. He's being faithful to what he had told me in that bedroom all those years ago when I was seven years old. I'm gonna take you on an adventure and I'm gonna go with you and you can trust me. You won't be alone. And what I have found out over the years through church and ministry and the good and the bad is that God is the only person that I can count on. God is the only person I can count on. Yes, he is. So I left Chicago. Uh, we had uh, Hannah and decided that uh, he was calling me to something different. And I worked at a church in Huntersville for about 10 years. I watched God do amazing things there at that church. Uh, the church grew from about 300 to 2,300 and three campuses. It was amazing, but I knew that God was calling me to something else. There was something else I was supposed to do because ministry there became very hard and it became confused by God what was doing with me again and decided that he had called me to something else, so I left. I didn't have anywhere to go, uh, but I felt God was telling me um, that there was something else that he wanted me to do. So uh, knowing what I know now, it all makes sense because it took me two years of training, more training by God, more teaching, because I'm not that smart, for him to get me ready on what he wanted me to do next. One of my mentors told me one time, he said, in your 20s, you're trying to figure out what it is. In your 30s, you're getting good at it. In your 40s, you're doing it. And in your 50s, you teach it. I thought that was interesting, because at this point, I was in my 30s, and I was wondering and pondering what it was and trying to figure out, was I getting good at it, and what is it? But it helped me sit down and figure out that for me and my gifts and my talents and the story that God had put in my life at this point, for me, the it was building teams and growing faith in other people and telling them that God loves them and he cares and he doesn't leave us alone. He goes with us and we can trust him for all of it. So interesting enough, when I was 40 years old, I started Mission City Church and interesting And I figured it was time for me to start doing the it. I had no idea what I had signed up for and you guys know the rest of the story here at Mission City because you've all been part of it. And God has not left us alone and he is faithful to finish what he started. I believe it and I know you believe it too. But what if through this whole story that I just told you, what if all of this life experiences that I've had, that you've had, what if all of it was a lie? What if I've been lied to? What if you've been lied to? What if everything about my story and your story is just coincidence? Chance, good stuff happens, bad stuff happens, some more good stuff happens, some more bad stuff, that's just life. And it has nothing to do with God. He had nothing to do with any of that. What if God has had nothing to do with my life or my story? What about you? 
Or the bigger question, at the heart of my faith and my life, your life, hopefully, the cornerstone of why I made all these decisions is what if Jesus is still dead? What if he never came back to life? If he's dead, then he couldn't have anything to do with anything that just, I just told you because he's dead. How could he? And see, this is a stumbling block for everyone when it comes to Jesus. No one questions whether he died. Even back then, the, the, the Pharisees in the New Testament were not bothered by the disciples going around talking about Jesus' death. They all knew he died. That's common knowledge. They were saying he came back to life. That's why they were upset. It was common knowledge, and it's indisputable, and it still is today, but they were mad because the disciples were saying, this guy is different than the rest. He came back from the dead. And the reason they were mad is because if he came back from the dead, then everything about what I believe has to change. Everything about what I believe has to change. See, Jesus is not simply a stumbling block because he's a man who did nice things and he taught love your neighbor as yourself and then he died an innocent man. Nobody has a problem with that. That's not the stumbling block for, for people. It's the resurrection. It's him coming back to life. Because the resurrection means this, check it out. He is God. That's what that means. He's in control. And if he's God and he's controlled, then I'm accountable to him and you're accountable to him. The whole world is accountable to him. Let me tell you something. The world is not offended by two blocks of wood that crucified Jesus. The stumbling block for them is a stone that was rolled away from the tomb that morning. So, this, so the stumbling block is actually a stumbling block. Interesting. It's actually a rock. Now look what Paul says about all of this. If the resurrection didn't happen, look what he says. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14. But if Christ has not been raised, now I want you to think about your story and the story, my story that I just told you. That if he has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is in vain. And also we are found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ who he did not raise if after all then the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised either. But if Christ has not been raised, your faith is empty. You are still in your sins. And as a further result, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished if we have put our hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all people most pitiable. Powerful words. Paul lays it down for us. And he says, we got three major problems. Major problems if the resurrection didn't happen. If he's still dead. And here's what they are. Number one, our preaching is in vain. Our faith is empty and we have perished. For him to say our preaching in vain, it means that our purpose in life means nothing. That's what I take. Because we are all called as believers to preach the good news. And what is the news? Jesus is alive. That's what we're supposed to be called, we're called to do. But if he's not alive, then our preaching is in vain. It never happened. And therefore, our calling and what we say God has called us to means nothing and our lives have no purpose. For Paul to say our faith is empty, uh, he also means that we're coming against God. He talks about this, that we're preaching, he said, another God that comes in contrast and opposition to the real God. And he's not gonna stand for that because we're saying that Jesus is God. And so that goes against him being God. How, he's gonna be really mad about that. He's not gonna like that. We started watching the, the Lord of the Rings uh, came up on Netflix this weekend and you remember that scene where one of the magicians is standing there and he says to him, it's my favorite scene in the movie, and he says, there's only one Lord of the Rings and he does not share his power. I love that scene. And that's true, he doesn't share his power. And so if we're saying Jesus is God and he's not God, we got a major problem because our faith is in Jesus. And so we're bearing false witnesses against God Almighty, saying that Jesus is his son and he's the way to eternal life. So our faith is the belief that Jesus has come to save us from our sins and that he himself is God. And if he's not God, 
then our faith is in vain. We aren't forgiven. We're still in our sins. We aren't made right with God. And number three, he says, we're already dead. We've perished. Not just us, but all the ones who've gone before us. The Old Testament and everybody. Because they believed in the Messiah that was coming. That's where their faith was. And so they stay dead. And when we die, so do we. There's no life. If we call ourselves Christ followers and Jesus is dead, we have no one to follow. So the world should pity us more than all others. Look what he says in verse nine. If we have put our, cry, our hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all people most pitiable. So people who don't believe in Jesus Christ as a savior of the world, no wonder they look at us and feel so bad at Christians. I can't believe they believe this stuff. Because if Jesus is dead, we've made a big mistake. And we've been lied to and we're lying to others and our whole life is a sham. But, praise God, that is not the case. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. Applause. <laughs> but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since through a man came death, he's talking about Adam, when Adam sinned, also through a man came the resurrection of the dead, which is Jesus. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will, may, will, uh, will be made alive. So Paul says, but the truth is, is none of this talk of Jesus as being dead is true. He's alive and that changes everything. I want you to remember the word changed. It's gonna come up in a minute. Say it with me, changed. changed. It's gonna come in just a minute because it's super important. Jesus is alive. Paul met him on the Damascus Road. That's why he knows he's alive. Peter walked on water with him, and then he walked after the resurrection with Jesus. Hundreds saw Jesus alive after he was dead, and this changes everything. Our preaching, our preaching is not in vain. It's actually rock solid. It's based on a rock, actually. <laughs> that was a rolled away so that my king could come out of the grave that morning and see the sun. The same sun that he made rise up over the earth that he made that's spinning in the universe that he spoke into existence. My king is alive. And that's what my life is based on. My faith is not empty. My faith is full up. The opposite of empty is full. And I wanna be found full, not empty. What's our motto for Mission City Church? A family of faith growing faith in families. That's what we wanna do, not empty, but growing, overflowing, more faith, more trust in him. And then lastly, he says, we've not perished, but we are alive in him. So now what? So if all of that is true, the question of whether he died and came back, that's all a lie. He did, I mean, he did come back. It's a lie that he didn't. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, Paul talking to us. So, so then, my dear brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know, this is great, because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So Paul tells me that my story that you just heard, your story of faith in the Lord, it's not in vain it's not in vain. So three things Paul tells us here. Let's look at it. Notice um, everything today I said is in groups of three. So here's three more. Help us remember. Number one, be steadfast. Number two, be immovable. And number three, abound in the work of the Lord. Steadfast, what does that mean? That means to take a hold of Christ and don't let go. Be constant in your faith. Be unwavering. Depend on him. Be immovable. And this is tough sometimes because you can't let the hurts of this world shake you. You have to let those hurts bring you back to God. And when life takes you on a different turn than you had made plans for, he's saying stand immovable in your faith that God has called you to and he's walking with you in it. And you've heard my story. I've seen some highs and some lows, but I can promise you that God was there through all of it. I felt his presence. I know he was. And so he says, abound in the work of the Lord, not in the work of men. That's what I take from it. Be found doing things that honor God. Be found preaching the good news. 
Be found trusting God in the hard times. Be found worshiping God with his followers and encouraging other people in their faith. Be found loving the broken and helping the poor and praying for the sick. Abound in the work of the Lord. And you're driving around in your free time and you're all by yourself. You think about this, am I abounding in the work of the Lord? Am I doing what he's called me to do? He's not dead. He's alive. It changes everything. Abound in the work of the Lord. Listen here. We all have a story, okay, in this life. And I'm hoping that this morning that my story can encourage you. Because when we surrender our life to him, when we surrender our life to Jesus Christ, let me tell you, he takes our faith very seriously. He does. And what I'm saying is so should we. We should take our faith as serious as he does. Never walk away through the hard times and the mystery and the job loss and the loneliness and losing ones that we love. We should be steadfast and be immovable because here is what we have to look forward to because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything that I've told you so far leads to this verse that I'm getting ready to, and I, I mentioned change. Listen to the change that we have looking forward to. This is extraordinary. And I'm hoping that you won't lose your voice screaming so loud when you hear this, okay? If I set this up or not. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Paul says, I don't even understand it myself. We will not all fall asleep, but we will be changed. In a moment, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. You know what that means? You know what a perishable item is, right? It goes away. Imperishable, never go away. Eternal, always, and we will be changed. And there's the word change, life change. So I'm saying live that changed life now because that's what's coming. That's what we have to look forward to. Live knowing one day this body will be changed. And let me tell you, the way my body's headed, I need to change. You know what I'm saying? I used to like this thing. Now it ain't working right. It's got flat tires and stuff. <laughs> it ain't running all, all eight anymore. But we will be changed in a moment. And when we see Jesus, let me tell you, when we see Jesus face to face, we are going to fall down and we were going to worship him with the multitudes and we were going to call out in a loud voice like the Bible said, glory to God in the highest. And we're going to say like they say in Revelation, praise to the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Unbelievable. The resurrection should mean something to us because if it never happened, then we... The series is titled Easter in September. Um, week one was titled The Power of Christ and the Faith of His Followers. My week two sermon was Jesus Came to Die So You Can Live Today. And today's sermon is this. If the resurrection is real, then we better live like it. Live like it happened. And if you've noticed, each week there's been sort of a theme, <laughs> been the same thing, that Jesus is alive. That news matters and we need to live like it matters and we need to live like he's alive and grow our faith in a resurrected king. Amen. Yes. To live like Paul is describing though takes effort and uh, it takes commitment and it takes prayer. It takes a lot of prayer. And we've been praying for one another each week. We're going to continue that today. So after I pray here in just a minute for the sermon, I want you guys to come down here to the altar and ask God to help you take your faith to the next level, the faith that is not in vain, and to take that faith as serious of a thing as he does. So my question is, are you gonna surrender to him today? Now, if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, I wanna invite you to do that today. If you heard my story praying and asking God's forgiveness when I was just a kid, uh, if you've never done that, I want you to know that you can be forgiven. Come and talk to me today can be that day. If you need to come today and you need to ask God to give you the power to continue growing that faith that he started in you in the past and continue to walk the road that he's called you to in your story to finish the job that he promised to, uh, to finish in you, then let's come and pray about that today. But we, we value prayer uh, very much around this church. And I just want to grow that even more and more and more because I'm desperate for him and I'm desperate for 
the conversation and the relationship, and I hope you are too. So let me pray for us this morning.